This began as a PhD project and, and luckily uh, the book isn't like the PhD, so I've cut <laughs> out the 20,000 word methodology, uh, so you don't have to read that, although if anybody's interested. You know, <laughs> um, but it started off as a project to look at casual and precarious work. Um, so I wanted to look at how work has been transformed in the contemporary economy. And the step that I wanted to take to do this was to go into a workplace and find out what the work was really like. So much like many people, how they find this kind of work, I signed up to a job website and said, send me to a job. Had an idea that it would be a call center, um, but really didn't know what it would be like until I got there. Um, and this approach of kind of sending myself off into the call center, I take inspiration from the kind of classic ethnographies of sociology of you know, going to workplaces and studying what they're like and what it's like for people working in them. And combining it with a, a, a Marxist approach of kind of workers' inquiry, that workers themselves are the best able to describe their conditions, but also to be able to overcome them in various ways. So when I turned up at the call center, um, I found out that it would be selling insurance, life insurance, um, and in many ways, what, you know, whatever you're selling doesn't matter hugely because it's, you know, as long as you have the script, you could be selling cars or apples or internet packages or, or whatever it is. But uh, the call centre that I worked in was typical of a kind of high sales call centre. So it's based in London um, and it's anonymous for the purposes of the book. Uh, as you'll probably find out in various ways, it's, it's not possible to, to talk about where it was. But it has the features of a high volume, high sales call center. So very strict targets, uh, you know, surveillance and technology used in the workplace uh, to count everything that you're doing. And I think these are the two things that strike you uh, most clearly when you start working in a call center, is you see the targets everywhere from the moment you enter the call center floor. There are whiteboards with people's names on them. In the call center that I work, there was a television screen that hung from the ceiling with everybody's name cycling, ranked based on how many sales they had. So, you know, for some of the time I was at the bottom, uh, but managed to, you know, you could see yourself in comparison to every other person working there. And it's that, that kind of constant pressure is kind of almost tangible on the call center floor. And this combines with a kind of surveillance, which is, you know, everything you do is counted. You know, every call that you make, every sale that you make, every break is counted to the second. And all of this information can be pulled off you know, at a moment's notice. So once a week when you meet with a supervisor, you know, they sit down and they pull off reams of data about you. you know, how long did it take you to close a sale? You know, how many calls are you making? And on average, I would make between three to 400 calls in a, uh, in a shift, bothering people who didn't want to buy insurance and trying to convince them to, uh, to part with their money uh, for life insurance not a kind of small uh, decision to make, you know, quite a big decision to make taking out a life insurance policy uh, and something that you do without comparing it to other policies and so on. But what I want to, to start off with, I guess, is to talk about the kind of effects and how you, how you close a sale, so the difficulty of doing these things. So every shift begins with a buzz session. You know, you're invited into a room next, you know, next door to the call centre and you sing a song or do a quiz or some other kind of demeaning activity to get you prepared for, for the shift ahead. Um, and the favorite that one of the supervisors had was this, this iPhone game where you hold it up and it tells you to mime out a particular, uh, you know, an animal or an accent or so on and films the person doing it. So you can humiliate the person after they've, uh, after they've pretended to be an antelope or, or, or something. And this is a weird phenomenon you know, why get people to act like this before a shift? And it's about trying to mobilize people's emotions, trying to get people in the mood to sell. Because when you're trying to sell insurance, it's a kind of hard sell in many ways. You know, insurance isn't an exciting thing. And so what you're trying to do is recreate that, that social interaction that many of us value, but do that over the phone, you know, with only your voice to be able to convince somebody that they should buy insurance and find a way to make a connection with somebody. And so I want to give a couple of examples of how, uh, of, of how I did this uh, in the call center. So the first is to make jokes. 
So jokes are a big part of the sales process. And there are two, and I'm sure you're all going to love these jokes, uh, is when you're confirming details, you have to confirm eligibility, so for tax reasons and so on. So the question is, do you spend seven out of 12 months a year in the UK? To which you add the joke, you know, because people say, of course, I spend that long, you know, I, I, you know it's most of the year, isn't it? So, so no long holidays planned this year. We go, oh, you know, I wish a five month holiday. And the next is, <laughs> that is the joke, sorry, that is the joke. You say no long holidays, and they go, of course, you know, I work a long job, I don't have, you know, may not have paid holiday time. The second part of the joke is, is that where, where you pay your taxes then? And you go, ah, there's no escaping that then, is there? And, you know, people have a bit of a chuckle and say, it's just funny to hear someone saying this. And I started to add an extra bit to this joke, which was, there's no escaping that then, unless you're Vodafone, to which people would have quite a long laugh. Because, you know, this was when there was a, a large amount of press around the tax evasion. <laughs> this joke got me in a little bit of trouble. Um, and I'm not going to imply that this means that the company perhaps wasn't paying their tax properly, but, you know, we'll let that one, we'll let that one float out there. Um, but these kind of little jokes are ways to engage people. You know, you're talking about boring details about tax, but you're giving that personality and trying to have some charisma over the phone. And it's these things that you start to use to build a rapport with people. You know, they might find that joke funny. Hopefully some of you found it funny. But for the person on the, doing the calling, you get to revisit that joke once every couple of minutes, over and over again in the shift. And you can try and experiment with other jokes, but these are the tried and tested ones. So you hear them echoing around the call center, you know, all throughout the shift. And during this moment, you do something, you know, slightly less kind of, light-hearted, which is to take details from them about how many dependents they have, what kind of work they do. And you get this moment where if you hear they have dependents, you think in your head, they're going to be more likely to buy life insurance. They have people who are relying on them. You know, what are they going to do? And you can bring this up later on. What would you do if you died suddenly? How, how would you look after your two children? And so there's something quite kind of, as you go through these details, you're trying to find out things about people that you can then mobilize the sell insurance to them. And you start to treat people a little bit like a kind of a, a puzzle, essentially. What are their details? And what's the angle I could take to convince them to buy insurance? Now, supervisors were constantly pressuring you, whether through the, the kind of reams of data that they go through or their physical presence on the call center floor. And I want to give an example of two calls, which I think will probably always stay with me which kind of highlight the supervisory relationship in the call center. So the first is on confirming the details. Uh, I said somebody, so you still have two dependents? And they said, no, no, I, I have one dependent. Uh, and you go, okay, I'll update that. Why might they only have one dependent now? And you can start to hear the voice cracking up on the phone and somebody starts saying, I've just lost my child to leukemia. And I'm having this moment where you know that you can't end the call unless they say, Specifically, I'd like to end the call. So say, oh, you know, if you, if you don't want the call to continue, you just have to let me know. No, 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 it's okay. They start crying. The supervisor <coughs> comes on the line, and I can see them behind me, and they start tapping on my shoulder. This is your sale. This person is grieving. This is how you're going to get them. You know, what they know about death. This is the life insurance sale. And I hung up the phone because I found that a very difficult thing to do and was taken for a talk about, you know, why are you letting a sale like that slip through your fingers? The second one is uh, somebody who I called in a waiting room and they said, I only have a little bit of time because I'm waiting to have dialysis. Uh, and you have this moment again where you think, you know, would you like to continue the call? Yeah, yeah, I can continue it. And again, they start to kind of break down. You know, I'm not going to be able to take out this policy because I think I'm going to die. And you say, ah, the call centre uh, supervisor comes up behind you. We don't ask a question about that. This is the one you can push for to, to make your sale. Tell them it, we don't ask them any questions about their health. And I just want to give the sense of these questions. Not all of the calls are like this. Many of them are just being told to, uh, to go away in <laughs> slightly other language. Is the kind of stress of this job, the kind of uh, the emotional drain of trying to sell insurance to people who don't want to buy it. And for management, there was one tool which was much more effective than any other to motivate people. 
It wasn't necessarily the extra pay. It wasn't the high street vouchers. It wasn't being taken out for dinner. It was being allowed to go home early from the shift. I think this is hugely revealing in many ways that the biggest bonus in this kind of work is to let you leave work. So you meet your sales and you could go home. Now, during the time I worked there, uh, the company management had to change this policy because they found out that one fifth of all of the paid time was spent uh, at home or away from the phones. That it had become so effective that, that, that people were you know, being paid while they were in the pub or while they were watching TV at home. And I think it speaks volumes to the quality of the work, you know, what kind of work people are doing. But it also comes, you know, the kind of, the main act of resistance in a call center is just to leave. So turnover could be as high as 50% in a month. You have half of the workforce leave. Often it was less than, you know, 20% or so on. But the churn in these kind of workplaces is huge. And many people argue that this is a, a big structural barrier to organizing in a call center. And instead, what I've tried to argue in the book is that rather than seeing this as a kind of weakness, we should think about this as a kind of strength, something that we can mobilize around. This is an expression of the refusal of work in a call center, of people saying, I've had enough of this. You know, I don't want to be bullied by a manager. You know, I don't want to be under these kind of conditions. And in many ways, it's very similar to a strike. It's just that people aren't deciding to come back with demands. You know, it's running away from the workplace, much like a strike is, except not with the intention to return back to it. And in the book, I try to detail a number of these kind of smaller resistance practices. So ways to keep the breaks longer, you know, ways to extend the buzz session for five, 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of the shift. Things that to many of us might not seem like big victories. You know, they don't, they're not successful strike action or they're not large campaigns, but on the call center floor, 15 minutes extra before you start your shift is a whole number of difficult calls less to make that shift. And so on the question of organizing, I think what we have to talk about is how we connect those practices of resistance that begin from the work itself and use those as the basis to begin organizing. And in the last couple of minutes, I want to just talk briefly about the organizing that we did uh, in the call center. So we, we began with a number of other people, I began talking about how we would move these smaller practices into something more. And I'm very aware that as a PhD student, this wasn't my sole source of income. I was very careful not to kind of push people to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. But we started to meet fairly regularly. So we'd meet once or twice a week uh, in a pub with bookshelves with fake books on the bookshelf and an old tattered Stalinist era communist flag on the wall, uh, which had a kind of weird symbolism for the, the first organizing meeting. There was only ever one other person who'd been in a trade union before uh, who I organized with. He'd been in Usdor, uh, which if people are familiar with this union is perhaps not the most militant trade union uh, in the UK. But nobody else had ever been in a trade union. And one of the difficulties that we had that maybe we can discuss a little bit later on was connecting us organizing and meeting and talking about work with a trade union. And I think in a very revealing phrase, one of my colleagues, when we talked about what organizing would mean, that it would have to be secret from management, that we'd have to think about creative ways to do it. The closest analogy they had, and I had to look this one up uh, after the shift, was that it would be like Dumbledore's army. Um, which I know some people in the crowd will know uh, what that means. But comparing it to some kind of, you know, this idea that trade union organizing would be a kind of almost magical uh, uh, kind of undercover uh, thing. But what I want to argue is that it gave us something to do at work. Resistance isn't something you choose to do often. It's something you do because the work is difficult. It gives you something else to do at work. It relieves some of the pressure. And we spent, you know, we began to organize and we had some, some minor successes, but ultimately most people left. You know, by the end of my six months, uh, when I was finally fired from the call center, um, everyone I had started with had left by that point. You know, I was the only one left from my cohort. So the people who were coming to meetings were all new at that point. You know, they were friends of friends who'd started uh, and everybody else had left than myself with my ulterior motive of, uh, uh, of writing up about the experience. And 
what I hope is that those experiences didn't stop in that one call center, that people took those on to other places and said, you know, the attempt that we had there, we may not have made a permanent change, but this is something that's worthwhile doing elsewhere. You know, to have a sense that organizing at work is about more than just pay, it's about questions of control, about saying that supervisors can't treat you any way they want. And the book is a result of some of those discussions. You know, often researchers have this sense of we must share everything we write with people. Uh, I offered to share things I'd written about the, uh, the call center with other call center workers. Nobody ever wanted to read anything after a shift. It's kind of unsurprising. Um, but we talk through the ideas and talk through the arguments. And hopefully what the book does is gives you my experience of what it was like to work in that call center, what it's like to work under that surveillance, that control, but also give voice to some of those people who, you know, most of the time when we hear from call center workers, it's being harassed about PPI or, you know, to buy something that we don't want to, is to give a voice to some of those people working in casual work to say that it's not an area where we can't organize. You know, it's an area that has its own challenges, but ultimately, you know, it's from the work itself and the resistance practices that take place <coughs> that changes will come from. Thank you very much.